Hey, and welcome to another episode of Fast Forward, a podcast from QSR Magazine, where we talk to the founders, innovators, and entrepreneurs behind some of the world's most exciting fast casual restaurant concepts. My name is Sam Okus. I'm the editor of QSR and the editorial director of Food News Media. On today's episode, I'm really excited to share my conversation with Chipotle CEO, Brian Nickel. Uh, now, of course, Chipotle uh, really needs no introduction here. Everybody listening uh, is quite familiar with the story of Chipotle, uh, familiar with how the company that's been around since the early 90s has essentially reinvented the fast food restaurant industry. Uh, this is a company that, uh, founded by Steve Ells, really brought the chef influence into the fast food restaurant and proved that you could do high quality, freshly sourced uh, food in a counter service format uh, and basically single handedly uh, invent the fast casual restaurant industry. Uh, of course, everybody's also familiar too with the uh, challenges that Chipotle has faced in the last couple of years. Uh, in late 2015, the company suffered um, from several outbreaks of E. coli and norovirus that sickened hundreds of people. Uh, and, and really things kind of just hit a downward spiral at that point. Uh, went through a couple of years of, of downward sales, um, just couldn't really build any momentum. Um, Steve Ells uh, did a couple of media appearances that, um, you know, it just it seemed that the company wasn't really sure what to do to rebound from this episode. Um, so in early 2018, though, it seems that the company finally figured it out. Uh, Steve uh, Ells uh, announced that he would be stepping back from the CEO position, and there was a big search for the next CEO, and uh, Chipotle hired Brian Nickel. Uh, to be that guy. And Brian was uh, formerly the CEO of Taco Bell. Uh, but here's a guy that has, uh, you know, just incredible experience uh, from from restaurant industry and beyond. Uh, he started his career at Procter & Gamble. Uh, he spent 13 years at Yum! Brands. Uh, he spent time in the roles of uh, chief marketing officer at Pizza Hut. He was chief marketing officer at Taco Bell before he became president and then later CEO. Uh, this is a guy who knows a lot about brand management, a lot about branding, a lot about how to take take uh, a, a special iconic brand and to turn it into something um, that the the customer, the user uh, really wants and how to continuously improve and enhance uh, that product so that the customer continues to want to get that. Uh, and so what we've seen in the last year, ever since Brian took over, um, is finally Chipotle seems to have um, gotten its feet on the ground. Uh, so now uh, the sales have been positive for four straight quarters. Um, and, you know, suddenly this company has momentum again. And that was something that was really lacking. A big piece of why Chipotle has momentum again is because uh, the company invested in especially the digital uh, customer experience, uh, invested in mobile ordering and invested in, um, you know, pickup shelves at the restaurants after you order. Uh, and there's now uh, about a dozen uh, Chipotle lanes around the country, which is a drive through uh, operation for mobile orders. Um, and so, and there's also third-party delivery, of course, through through DoorDash, and and all of these ways. Um, you know, Brian and his team have really tried to do what he calls uh, remove the friction from the customer experience, trying to make sure that guests have the easiest and most effortless uh, um, experience with Chipotle that is possible. Uh, and it's clear that that's working. Um, so I, I'm really excited to see what Brian has done to Chipotle. Uh, this is a brand that, again, has been around for 25 years. It's an American icon now. Um, and it seems to have uh, cleared this hurdle uh, that, that really... Uh, first arise in 2015 and, and finally seems to be off and running again and, and growing again. Uh, a note about this podcast is a little different. So uh, in February, I flew out to Newport Beach, California to sit down with Brian and, and talk with him uh, about everything that Chipotle has been going through, about his work on the brand, about um, how his experience at Taco Bell and at other companies has helped to inform uh, what he has done in his role at Chipotle. Um, and we met in a restaurant in Newport Beach. And so you're going to hear a little bit of restaurant ambiance going on. You're, you're, you'll hear the employees working in the background. I think about halfway through our conversation, the restaurant actually opened. And so some customers were in there. So that's why you hear some of that restaurant ambiance. Um, but also, I just wanted to condense this interview a little bit, too, to just give you kind of the meat uh, of what Brian was talking about. So we jump around a little bit from subject matter to subject matter. Um, but is not the full conversation. Um, I also wanted to note too that uh, this conversation I turned into a story uh, that is our May cover story of QSR. If you want to read more, uh, please head over to qsrmagazine.com to read that story. I'm really, really excited just about what Chipotle is doing. Um, and we're really excited to get this conversation with Brian Nichol and be able to tell the Chipotle story. 
I kicked off my conversation with Brian uh, asking about his selection as the CEO of Chipotle. Uh, at the time that Chipotle announced that they were going to be looking for a new leader, uh, it seemed to all of us in the industry that he made the most sense. Uh, his name certainly popped up almost immediately as being uh, a, a good possible replacement. Um, so I, I asked him about that idea that uh, he seemed almost like a foregone conclusion to become the next Chipotle CEO. Well, look, you know, uh, one, I'm, I'm glad to hear uh, people saw it coming. <laughs> that means I was doing something right in my Just prior job. You. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I think it's one of those opportunities that present itself where I had admired the brands, um, you know, even before I started working at Yum. Um, you know, the first time I experienced Chipotle, I was living in Cincinnati uh, working for Procter & Gamble. And I remember when the brand came and, uh, you know, stood in line like everybody else. Uh, so when fast forward to today, you know, I think, you know, it was one of those opportunities where I just really believed the brand had gotten into this position of being very defensive as opposed to, you know, talking about what made the brand great. You know, this idea of food with integrity, giving people access uh, to a higher level of food um, that just didn't exist really before Chipotle created the category of fast casual. So uh, it was one of those opportunities where I was like, well, if I could get the opportunity, uh, I would love to have a chance to, you know, make the brand more visible and uh, transform it, I think, digitally. I saw that as a real opportunity just as, you know, a customer. Um, and then also, you know, I just thought there was a real opportunity to tell the story of Chipotle. Sure. So, and obviously having been with Taco Bell for several years, uh, having done great work and really kind of putting that brand, I think, on the cusp of innovation for what it was doing and t tying into, you know, this demographic, especially younger millennials, um, incredible work at Taco Bell. Oh, thank you. What kind of, what did you bring from Taco Bell that you apply, have applied to Chipotle in the last year? Yeah, you know, look, I, I think one of the things that, uh, you know, I'm very grateful for and the opportunity I had on uh, Taco Bell was reshaping it around the idea of being a youthful brand, a culturally relevant brand, and then using innovation uh, to do that, uh, both, uh, you know, taking advantage of the new mediums that were evolving um, and then just communicating, uh, I think, in an authentic way. So, you know, I, I kind of share this with folks, but one of the fortunate things I had early in my career, and this is a benefit, I think, of going to Procter & Gamble is, you know, I'd, I'd spend a year and a half working on scope. Then I would spend, you know, a year and a half working on VIX products, cough cold products. Then I'd go work on Pringles potato chips. And sure, then, yeah. you know, so you're kind of bouncing around. And w what you realize quickly is you have to understand how does the business, you know, uh, financially make money? How, what's the economic model? What's the brand or uh, uh, product's point of difference? And then how do you take that point of difference and turn it into communication where people feel like it fits into their life, they want to engage, um, it becomes even more important. And that's really the tools that I've taken over time. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I learned early into my career is, look, if you have opportunities uh, where ec the economics allow you to do different things, you should take advantage of those opportunities. And Chipotle is a great example of that, right? We, we invest in food. If you compare our P&L to a lot of other people, you'll see our food costs are higher. Right. Um, and that's by design because it really results in the point of difference for this company. Um, and the other thing I learned once I finally got to Chipotle was the line with how fast people are able to move through it and get that customization with this quality food, that is a tremendous point of difference. Sure. Um, and so, you know, there were different things at my prior role that created a tremendous point of difference and, you know, all the way back to when I first started out on Scope Mouthwash. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so it's interesting, too, because uh, when you think about Chipotle, this is a brand that really started as a culinary-oriented brand, founded by a chef, uh, very proud of the food quality as it should be, and now you're coming in with more of a branding and marketing perspective. What, how has that transition been to be going from primarily this culinary oriented brand to focusing more on that branding element? Yeah, look, I think that's one of the things that I uniquely bring into Chipotle is uh, more of the brand uh, perspective. Um, you know, to Steve's credit, I think he always knew he had a special brand. Mm -hmm. uh, granted, it was centered on culinary and his passion of culinary and, you know, luckily there's never been any compromise on the culinary aspect of the company as they've grown. Um, and, you know, 
I am highly convicted to not allowing any compromise on the culinary aspect of this company. Because we aren't going to do that, though, that's what we need to make sure people understand is at the core of this brand. Mm -hmm. And I think people didn't hear that enough, and we're starting to question whether or not that was the case when I came into the job. So mm -hmm. the, the nice thing that I've got um, from a branding perspective is this huge commitment to culinary, which is a huge point of difference at our scale. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as a result, I've also figured out, like, okay, well, what are the things we can commercialize as a result of that? So. You know, our digital transformation is much more centered on how do we make it less friction, easier access for the customer versus when I first got here, the digital transformation was more focused just on the back of the restaurant on like, okay, how do we operate with digital orders? Mm -hmm. They hadn't turned the corner yet on, okay, well, how do we turn that digital operation now into the easiest digital experience for the consumer? Sure. Yeah. So that's kind of the you know, where I've been able to make an impact early in my time with Chipotle. You know, mm -hmm. when I when I first got here, one of the things I love about this company, too, is we didn't have the idea of doing mobile pickup shelves. Oh, right. So I start, you know, in March, and uh, I have the experience of the digital order, and uh, I come in, and I realize, wow, this is pretty awkward. Like, I don't know where to go to pick up the food. I don't know where I'm supposed to get into line, if I'm supposed to get into line or not. And the poor cashier is looking at me trying to figure out, like, should she help me or should she help the guy coming down the line, right? right? Yeah. Um, now, with that said, the, the way the order came in and the ability for the guys to actually make the order, it was great. Mm -hmm. We just had to solve the experience for the person coming into the restaurant. So we came up with the pickup shelves. We implemented that in fairly short order. We're going to have it in all our restaurants by you know the middle of 2019. Um, and it wasn't even on the radar back in March. Yeah. So you know, I think that's just an example of my background of understanding what the consumer experience is married with, I would say, some operational excellence and an attention to culinary details that I really hadn't seen in any restaurant company, especially at this scale. So talking about that, you know, some of the, the past work that Chipotle has done, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, you talk about like 2002, 3, 4, 5, when Chipotle really started to take off. What Chipotle was doing at that time was completely different, I think, than really anybody. Yeah. Uh, but now we've gotten to a point where this is not so unusual. I mean, they're, they're the fast casual category has exploded. I think fresh ingredients has been a touch point of a lot of different brands. So on one hand, what do you think consumers' impression of food with integrity or real ingredients is today? And how do you make sure that rises above the noise of the other brands? Yeah, look, I, I, I love the fact that the fast casual category is continuing to grow. Um, because what that means then is I think Chipotle is doing a great job of leading the change in food culture. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that is critical. And, you know, I, whether it's sweet greens, um, you know, cava, um, with some other ones that I've seen lately. Here um, in California, you have uh, Mendocino Farms. Oh, yeah, Mendocino Farms. Yeah. yeah, right. Actually, I was just, uh, you know, visiting it. Mendocino Farms was right next to a Chipotle. Um, and, you know, it was a great sandwich experience. One thing that I've noticed, though, is because of the scale that Chipotle has, um, we have a tremendous value proposition within the fast casual category. Yeah. So, you know, some of those competitors we just talked about, you know, it's anywhere from six seven dollars more expensive than the seven or eight dollar chicken burrito you're getting from chipotle sure. so i love the fact that in the fast casual category not only are we a leader in food culture and food with integrity we're also a leader in the value proposition so that more and more people can experience what i believe is a real difference you know fresh ingredients being prepared every day with real culinary skills results in i think more delicious food yeah. and I, the more people will have access to that i think they'll see that's the way I want to eat. And, you know, I hope we have more and more uh, people join us to get to our scale in the fast casual category. I mean, one of the weaknesses, frankly, of a lot of those concepts we just mentioned, you know, they're still not getting past 100 restaurants yet. Sure. So they still, it's hard to go from 10 to 100. It's really hard to go from 100 to 1,000. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, I hope they're successful uh, because that just means we've been successful changing food culture and more people are committed to this idea of fresh, ingredients, real ingredients, clean ingredients with real culinary cooking. 
From here, Brian and I went into a conversation about the customer experience. Uh, Brian has used the phrase before in uh, other interviews, and then he used the phrase again in, uh, in our interview back in February about this idea of removing friction from the customer experience. Uh, and I-, I wanted to know a little bit more about what that meant to him uh, and what that meant to the Chipotle experience and how the company has really uh, set out to evolve that experience over the last year and then, and then how that has actually been working for the Chipotle business. Well, so, you know, one example is what we were talking about earlier. When you order digitally, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, it's really amazing if you think about it. You order digitally, you walk into the restaurant, you grab your food and go. Yeah. I mean, bang, it's done. Uh, you know, off-premise occasions, this delivery proposition. I mean, I've been really delighted. Our partnership with DoorDash and uh, how that's evolved over time. Um, I think we're one of the fastest delivery solutions in the DoorDash marketplace. Mm -hmm. You know, I think on average we're 30 minutes or a little less than 30 minutes. Um, So, you know, that's an example of removing friction. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, if you're a family and, you know, it's like you've got kids going in all different directions. The next thing you know, it's 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock. You haven't done anything for dinner. If you know you can get Chipotle caliber food, um and get exactly what your family wants delivered in less than 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, that's that's a game changer. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, So that's that's another example. Another example is, you know, we've gotten feedback where it's like, look, I love this mobile order ahead. I wish I didn't even have to get out of my car though. Right. Um, And you know, you've, obviously there's the curbside scenario where you're running food out, but um, we're experimenting with this idea of the Chipotle lane where you order ahead in the app and then you know literally you pull up to the side of the building and we've got a window there for you and it's a mobile pickup window and you don't even have to get out of your car so th- those are the examples of just removing friction giving more access and then the other key piece is people are asking us to build more restaurants yeah. um, so there's just that simple aspect too it's like put a physical chipotle closer to me um, yeah. which we'll do as well the chipotle lane is is really interesting to me because this was another thing that i think 2011, 2012, nobody could really imagine a Chipotle with a drive through because again, that's, that used to be sort of fast food touch point. Yeah. Um, but as a father of two young children and, you know, knowing my wife, it's it, a pain to take those kids out of the car seat. It is really hard. And <laughs> you don't, right. and you don't want to be, um, you know, you don't, you, you sit there wondering like, is it okay if they're in the car alone for 30 seconds? Yeah, you right, know? right. <laughs> you right. start going to that process. But, um, so the drive through we've always thought is like, well, that makes a lot of sense for Chipotle. So I've been really happy to see you guys moving in that direction. But I understand, too, I mean, you're going to have to do, it's going to be change the way you approach new locations. And this is primarily new builds, new new it will locations. Be. Yeah, yeah, new end caps uh, and new freestanding mm-hmm. buildings. But, you know, the thing that I think has been the unlock for the Chipotle lane is the fact that we have this digital app. Mm-hmm. You know, back in uh, 2010, 11, we didn't have that. Mm-hmm. And uh, it would have been really difficult to experience Chipotle the way people experience Chipotle, which is high level of customization. Uh, without this technology. Yeah. And uh, that's what I mean by it. The, the digital transformation allows Chipotle to still give all this customization at tremendous speed and tremendous value. And now you don't even have to get out of your car, yeah. right? Or yeah. you can have somebody else pick it up and bring it bring to it you. Bring it to your house. Um, which, you know, none of these opportunities existed five, six, seven years ago. That's right. Which is kind of crazy if you think about it, right? Yeah. Well, and it's interesting, I mean, to think that some of these things are really giving Chipotle new life. I mean, um, obviously, you know, you can do so much with marketing and menu, but when you have the experiential piece of it, that really starts to change the game. And and what I was wondering about that word sort of experience for Chipotle. Like, what do you hope the consumer experience can be? And and how do you think it's kind of evolved in the last couple of years? Yeah, look, I think uh, one of the experiences of Chipotle is we've got great design in our restaurants Mm -hmm. as well. Uh, So we always talk about this, like, I always want us to have a great seat. Mm -hmm. You know, I I want people to come into Chipotle and feel like, hey, I'm in a cool environment, Um, you know, and that's how the brand was started. When you first walked into these Chipotles, you're like, I had never seen design that way, right? right? And uh, so we want to continue to make sure we've got relevant design where you enjoy sitting down at the table with your friends, or even if you're doing it by yourself, you like being in the space. The other thing we want to continue to drive is our food is great Mm off-premise. You know, that burrito wrapped in foil, you know, I'd argue it's almost better if you give it five, ten minutes to kind of take on a little bit of heat, marinate a little bit, right? It, It makes it even better. And then the bowl is perfect for 
you know, an off-premise occasion. Um, so, you know, I think we're going to have to continue to evolve our packaging mm -hmm. as more and more of the business happens either at people's homes or at off-premise occasions. Because I want them to have these great burrito experiences, these great bowl experiences. Um, you know, I think we have work to do to get make our tacos off-premise be as great of an experience as our burrito and bowl. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think with some packaging, we can do that. Sure. You know, uh, we're working on a quesadilla. Talk about a great product that's great in the restaurant or off premise, you know, uh, it's 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 another one of these. It's just you know, super hot, yeah, delicious delicious food, and you know, you make the cheese all melted. It's even better. It's interesting with Chipotle. I don't think any brand has been under the microscope, especially with menu innovation. Any little thing you guys test, it yeah. is, it's everywhere, and people it's are crazy, like, right? You got to go check it out. Um, so now you have the avocado tostada that you're check you're testing. Yeah. You have the quesadilla you're testing. You know, there are other things like a Mexican chocolate milkshake and right. some other things. Um, how, how, how do you, how can you leverage menu innovation to further bring that new life to Chipotle, especially for a brand that sort of famously did not ever really change the menu? Yeah, look, I think it's a, uh, well, first of all, the way we've categorized our innovation is it's, uh, can we meet our guest requests? So a highly requested item is a quesadilla. Mm. So that falls in that category. And then it's like, can we lead people in food culture with uh, our food innovation? So like, for instance, we just did chorizo, we brought it back. Um, you know, I think we're gonna be experimenting with things like carne asada, um, you know, other proteins and ingredients. Mm -hmm. uh, and then with beverages, you know, we're, we're testing right now, this hibiscus lemonade, the strawberry lemonade. Oh, yeah. um, I think we have an opportunity to take our beverages to an elevated uh, space that matches the food mm -hmm. experience, right? So, um, you know, that's how we're thinking about it. It's like, what, what, are, what are the, menu innovations that basically just meet our customer requests and what are the menu innovations where we think we continue to lead food culture mm -hmm. regardless of all of it though it cannot screw up our great throughput and the ability to the customer the customization that they want yeah um, so that has to stay at the core of it that's the balancing act of course, we all know that Chipotle has had really innovation down uh, in the menu side of things for a while now. Uh, but the company is trying to innovate in other ways, and that includes with its people. Um, you know, of course, a, a company the size of Chipotle uh, can only really be as strong as its system of people, both on the front lines in the stores, but also behind the scenes uh, at the corporate level. And this is something that Brian and I talked about, how the company is really trying to invest in its people uh, both on the on the store side and at the corporate side. Yeah, look, it, you know, I'm, I'm probably not telling you anything you haven't heard before, but a lot of it comes down to our restaurant managers. Uh, they lead these teams. If our restaurant managers um, are committed to their team, mm -hmm. uh, we end up with better teams. And what do I mean by committed to their team? Well, they invest the time to hire the right person first and foremost. So do, are they a match for our culture? Are they committed to the purpose of cultivating a better world? Are they committed to the idea of food with integrity, right? Uh, once you have that, then the next piece is, well, how do we train you to execute in your job? Mm -hmm. um, because people, they want to be competent. You know, nobody likes to walk into a job not knowing what they're supposed to do. Yeah. And so we've invested a lot of time making sure people understand their roles and responsibilities uh, and that they're trained on whether they're making burritos, making guacamole, or cooking the chicken, right? Mm -hmm. Um, they need to know what success looks like. And the really good managers coach right there with them so they see what success looks like. Where we have problems with turnover is either we hired the wrong person, wasn't a culture fit, or the second piece is we don't take the time to train them up so that they're competent and they feel confident in their job. Right. Those are the two reasons why people leave their jobs. Mm -hmm. Now, fortunately for us, we don't have a problem with people wanting to work at Chipotle. We attract a lot of people. Our challenge is how do we make sure we hire the right ones and then keep the really good ones? Yeah. Um, because there's quite a cost of rehiring, yeah. retraining, and, you know, start over, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think as our employees understand there's a tremendous career opportunity, uh, you know, there aren't many places that are growing like us. You know, we're going to build 150 restaurants roughly this year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that means we're going to need, you know, probably another 30 field leaders, which mm -hmm. a field leader runs like eight restaurants. Well, where do I get those 30 field leaders from? Hopefully our restaurant managers. Mm -hmm. Well, if I got to move 30 restaurant managers to field leader and I'm opening 150, I need 180 new restaurant managers yeah. just in 2019. Right. Crazy. Um, so if you come in, you're a team member, you're successful as a team member, you could find yourself running a $2 million business in a matter of 
two and a half, three years uh, with 30 plus employees, um, you know, making in that $70,000 range, um, yeah. which is phenomenal, right? Great opportunity. Yeah, terrific opportunity. So I, I think it's just, it, it, it takes finding the great managers, keeping those managers engaged so that they take the time to then go train the future managers and you know, ultimately hire the right people uh, that should be a part of the sure. Chipotle business. For the last half of my conversation with Brian, uh, we, we finally got to it. We finally talked about uh, what Chipotle went through back in 2015 about uh, this, these food safety issues that plagued the company and, and went on actually for, for a couple of years and in various uh, cases across the country uh, and just sort of talking about how overcoming that has positioned the brand for the future and, and what it meant to about where Chipotle was in the past, whether or not this was a company that was unwilling to to change, unwilling to stray far from what uh, it had established uh, early on in, in the company, company's history. Uh, and, and whether or not that unwillingness to change kind of exacerbated, I guess you could say, some of these food safety issues. So uh, we talked about that and then and really what this meant, means for the future of Chipotle and, and where Brian sees the company going from here. Look, they were tremendously successful for 20 plus years and they hit a rough patch and it was just difficult, I think, for the organization to pivot and deal with the change mm -hmm. and uh you know that presented an opportunity for myself um which you know i'm very fortunate that i was given the opportunity um you know and look i'm loving it because there's so much growth in this business um that yes it's going to require change and yes the relocation was hard the reorganization was hard um you know you don't love doing those things but it was the right thing to get this company focused on what's next mm -hmm. um, as opposed to, as we were talking about earlier, dwelling on what's happened in the past. Yep. And, uh, you know, so far, knock on wood, you know, mm -hmm. we've, we've been smart about who we've hired and uh, we've been very fortunate that a lot of the things we've implemented have gained traction nicely in its early days. There was about a three year period where that it was tough for Chipotle. Sure. Sales were really struggling, um, I guess two years, say. Uh, and obviously, a lot of it comes back to the, the E. coli and norovirus uh, outbreaks. Uh, and I, I think what I, a lot of people have talked about sort of this idea that maybe Chipotle lost the consumer trust. I'm wondering if you think that that was sort of the main problem of what, uh, of what happened. And if so, how, do you, how are you regaining customer trust? Yeah, look, one of the key ways is don't have any more food safety issues. Sure. <laughs> you know, so yeah. it's like, I, you know, I know everybody thinks there's some magic to this. But one magic piece here is have an extended period of time with no food safety issues. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we are maniacal about our food safety. I think you experienced, I experienced it, right? it, yeah. You know, it, you can't get to, into the back of our restaurant without a wellness check. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're implementing every piece of technology we can. And when I mean technology, it's like soap. Uh, that now kills norovirus, mm. uh, cleaning materials that kill norovirus. Uh, we've, we've put in filters mm. that actually are killing more bacteria and cough cold viruses and all kinds of things that, you know, I, I don't think anybody else is invested in. Mm. But we're investing in it because what we're not going to give up on is real ingredients freshly prepared every day. Mm. So we have to be better on the food safety aspect of it. So, you know, staying away from any food safety issues. Uh, is a big piece of the puzzle of restoring that trust. Mm -hmm. And over time, that will be the case. I think the other thing, too, is reminding people like, hey, we're actually not giving up on real ingredients done with real cooking um, that gives you terrific, delicious food. Mm -hmm. um, and you can do that at our scale safely. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, you know, like the ad showing people like, hey, we're still cooking the chicken on the plancha. It's still freshly marinated. Uh, you know, guys are cutting avocados every morning, making guacamole. Those are important things to remind people of um, while uh, you continue to, you know, have no issues on the food safety side. You talked about getting to 6,000 locations or, or whatever yeah, it is yeah, someday. Yeah. You're at 2,500. You just opened 2,500. Right. Um, what's the biggest challenge in getting Chipotle there? Well, you know, not surprising uh, people. Yeah. Um, you know, as we were talking earlier, right, it's like when you open 150 restaurants or, you know, probably some point we'll be opening 175 or 200 or, 
you know, I think at our peak, we were opening 250. Um, you got to have people to run those restaurants. And I would prefer those people come from our internal organization mm -hmm. so that we're developing them so they can walk into a Chipotle, they've already got the experience. Mm -hmm. Now, we're not going to be able to do 100% of that, but if like 80, 85% of those jobs are sourced from our Chipotle organization, I think we will be that much more effective at opening those restaurants. That is really the limiting factor for us because mm -hmm. the economics would suggest we should be opening a lot more, a lot faster. Mm -hmm. um, people's feedback is we want you in our community, right? So it's not like we're short on sites or we're short on economics. It's just a matter of, I want to make sure the existing business is running, you know, tip top so that we're developing the right people to walk into those restaurants and run them. Um, last thing you want to do is open a great new restaurant and then have a team in there that doesn't know the Chipotle business. Yeah. That'd be, that'd be a real shame. You guys have the un, sort of unfair advantage of almost having single-handedly created the fast casual industry, <laughs> yeah, right. right? So right. it's like, you know, 10 years ago, we were hearing everybody say they wanted to be the Chipotle of whatever. Right. Um, how do you maintain that leadership status? I mean, now you, you guys have come back, so we, we see the financials are back. Yeah. You know, 6.5% sales growth in this latest quarter. But it goes beyond that, right? The leadership status. And what, do you, what are you identifying as those as areas you can maintain it? Look, I think we have to lead in people development if we want to continue to lead. We have to lead in uh, food sourcing and animal practices if we want to lead. Uh, and then we have to lead, I think, in the digital transformation. Um, we do these things. I think we can continue to lead the category, continue to grow the category. And uh, I think more and more people will say, that's the way I want to eat. Mm -hmm. I, I personally believe that, um, and I've probably even gotten more conviction for this since being at Chipotle, that the way um, you know you hear people talking about, oh, these Gen Zs, they want a purpose, they want to eat clean food. I'm like, that's not just a Gen Z thing. That is everybody. That's everybody. That's everybody. Okay. Um, and you know, I see it even in my parents. Um, you know, they're in their 70s, and they're like, wow, you know, this food is really good. And you know, look, I, I, I was growing up with the processed food as the primary solution for meals. Mm. And I can tell you now, you know, that's not the case even uh, with, you know, in my parents' case, I guess they're baby boomers, you yeah. know. Mm. Um, but I see all age groups really embracing this idea of that's the way I want to eat. Um, and that's the way I think we'll be eating in the future. Sure. Um, and the more restaurants that get into this commitment to fresh, fast food, uh, done in a way that cares about the environment, meaning the farm environment, the animal welfare environment, and then frankly, your community's environment. I think the more people want to eat out and experience those restaurant concepts. Absolutely. Well, last question as we wrap up. Yeah. Uh, thinking about the future, what should we, wa we be watching for from Chipotle in the coming years, especially when you consider technology innovations and other directions you're taking the company in? What do you think is coming down the pike that uh, everybody should keep an eye out on? Well, I mean, look, one of the near-term things coming down the pike is uh, we're actually going to get going with a loyalty program. Mm. Uh, and the reason why that's important is I think that sets the stage for really how we'll connect in, with our consumers going forward. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think data uh, is the next layer of business opportunity for Chipotle. Mm -hmm. You know, today we have transaction-level information. In the future, we're going to be able to know that transaction is your transaction. And from that, what we hopefully do is take much better insights to make this place even more relevant for you. Uh, so, you know, how do we make it more relevant? Um, you know, we have some ideas. Um, you know, I think catering and group occasions off premise where there's no reason why you can't get fajitas from Chipotle. I mean, if you think about it, right, we do these great fajita veggies. We've got these terrific tortillas. We've got chicken and rice. At most places, they would call that a fajita. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> and so we could create that into a family uh, meal mm. where I don't know about you, but you know, when you have the babysitter watching your kids, I think I'd feel really good about getting fajitas for the kids yeah. and the babysitter on a Friday or Saturday night. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but the way we learn and figure that out is I think we've got to have another level of understanding of who our customers are and who these potential occasions are that Chipotle could fit. So I, I think you're going to see us really take advantage of uh, data to inform what's next. Um, but you know, I'm really excited about the programs that we have in place, the initiatives that are kind of 
within the next, call it 18 to 24 months. Mm -hmm. But man, I just think about the insight we're going to have going forward is just uh, really powerful. Yeah. Really powerful. It's awesome. I can't wait to see what comes next. Good. Thank you, Brian. I really appreciate your time yeah, today. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for taking the time. There you have it. It is a firsthand account from Chipotle CEO Brian Nickel about Chipotle, uh, the brand, the business, how it has overcome its challenges in the last couple of years, how he has helped to get it back on track, and then uh, where he sees this company moving into the future. Uh, my thanks first to Brian for taking some time out of his very, very busy schedule uh, to sit down with me and chat uh, and to the team at Chipotle uh, for arranging all the details of this. Of course, you can get all the news and insights that you need about the quick service and fast schedule restaurant industries at qsrmagazine.com. Of course, please do uh, subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and, and leave feedback too. We would love to hear more from you about uh, what you think of the show and uh, and also if you have any recommendations for folks that you think uh, that we should talk to. Uh, and with that, we are wrapping this episode. We will talk to you next time.